So um, we'll have uh, Matt Gross come up here. He's come up from Columbus, works at Couchbase, and uh, talk to us about full stack development. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you guys for having me up here. It's, uh, I say this on Twitter all the time. It's not an exaggeration. It's one of my favorite user groups that I go to. I've been here, this is my third or fourth time, I think. And so I really do like coming up here. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, too. So that's, that's really good to see. I got a weird setup here. If you haven't noticed, my laptop is all the way on the other side of the room. And the keyboard and mouse are up here. This is the first time I've tried this sort of thing before. So if uh, something goes a little weird, just bear with me. Um, we'll get through it. So uh, we're going to talk about full stack development with .NET and NoSQL tonight. I'm Matt Groves. That's my Twitter if you want to follow me and uh, observe my insane ramblings on Twitter. Let's make sure we know where we are here. Hopefully you guys know this already. Otherwise, I'm not sure how you found this place. But there's the uh, FanHug uh, website and the Meetup. I'm not sure which is the preferred one, Brian. But put them <laughs> both up there. And they have a Twitter account as well. And this is who I am, Matthew Groves. I just recently joined Couchbase as a developer advocate, which just means I blog about Couchbase and go around to user groups like this and speak about Couchbase and help people out on the forums and, and make, cool, make cool stuff with Couchbase. I have a podcast and blog at crosscuttingconcerns.com. Please go and check that out. I have some really impressive acronyms up there. So let's all take a minute to really just reflect upon those acronyms. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Those are just up there because whatever. What I really live by is that quote by Alan Stevens there. I'm not really an expert. I'm an enthusiast. So I'm excited about technology. I like to talk about it. I like to learn about it. I like to tell other people about it. So that's really, I'm just not an all-knowing expert up here. I'm just really an enthusiast. So before we get started, let me address this elephant in the room because I'm sure it's going to come up at some point. Anybody familiar with CouchDB in here? Okay, then maybe we can just skip that. No, uh, there's a product called CouchDB, and there's, a, there's also a product called Couchbase. I work for Couchbase, not CouchDB. They're two separate products that are in the same sort of NoSQL space, kind of, but they're not really related to each other. They're not a fork or not the same company or anything like that. They both just share an acronym, and they share a little bit of history. That's about it. During this session, if you guys feel like tweeting something interesting you've learned or something stupid I've said, please use the hashtag Couchbase so my boss knows I'm doing my job. I've got stickers for you, so if you do this, I'll give you a sticker. So if I have to bribe you, then, uh, then I will. OK, so let's get on with it now. Full stack <coughs> development with .NET and NoSQL. So if you're like me, you might look at this title and have some problems with it. The term full stack. Right? This is somewhat controversial because we're not writing the operating system. We're not writing the BIOS code. It's not really the full stack, right? Right, it's not really the full stack. It's really the application stack we're writing. We're writing the software stack, and we're writing some infrastructure code. So it's just kind of a shortcut term, kind of a buzzword. The other one up there I might have a problem with is the term NoSQL. And if you don't have a problem with it, I have a problem with it. And I work for a NoSQL company. This is because NoSQL doesn't really describe what it does, it describes what it doesn't do. Right? So it's kind of a weird, a weird buzzword that we have to use because it's just a, the term everyone's familiar with. So I came up with an alternate title for this talk that's a little more accurate, but a little less zippy. So uh, I think you'll agree that I'll stick with the full stack and the NoSQL uh, terms for now, if you don't mind. This is really what I mean by a full stack developer. If you're right there in the middle, if you're working with the database, you're writing front-end codes, you're writing back-end code, you're maybe scripting out infrastructure or deploying to the cloud. If that's you, then that's what I'm talking about with full stack. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. And by front-end, by the way, I don't just mean the web. I also mean mobile or desktop, et cetera. When we talk about stacks, you may have heard of some of the popular acronyms for stacks. So we have LAMP and we have MEAN. And a stack is, is just kind of the, the selection of tools that you use to build up an application you know, from, the, from, the o, from the OS up to the UI. And LAMP and MEAN are kind of catchy sounding, so they uh, are used a lot out there. But really, we don't have to use those specific acronyms, those specific tools in the acronyms. What it really means is just a collection of like, oh, the OS that we're using, the web server software, et cetera. 
So I'm going to be talking mostly about the, uh, the right side of the stack there. So this sort of a delineation in stacks, we'll get to that. But the, the mean stack generally is sort of a, a modern data approach to writing applications. And what do I mean by modern data is that we're writing endpoints that return maybe a JSON object or a JSON array to the browser. And in order to do that, we have to go to the database, a relational database, and we have to write a query and join together some tables and then spit out something like on the right side there, the JSON document. So what people who did this started thinking about was, well, what if we just store the JSON document in the database and fetch that out instead of having to worry about all these tables and joining them together? And there's some additional benefits to this in that you don't have to have such a rigid schema either. You can say, well, it's a JSON document. We can add more fields to it if we feel like it. We can add embedded hierarchies, embedded objects, and so on. So that's the sort of approach that we, we talk about with that NoSQL stack. Now, where is NoSQL a good fit? This is a slide they give me to sort of show people that gives them a rough idea of where it might be a good idea to use. But neither NoSQL or relational databases are a silver bullet, right? So it might be the case that you have a place for NoSQL in a legacy, legacy hardware or traditional business app, and vice versa. So my advice to you is to quote Jim Holmes, if you guys have heard of him, the only best practice is to use your brain, right? So if you look at NoSQL tonight and you say, oh, that'll be a good fit for our app, or, oh, I think we'll stick to relational, that's totally cool. My goal is to just get you to think of Couchbase whenever you're thinking about using a NoSQL database. So as long as that's on your list of, oh, I should consider one, two, three, and Couchbase is on that list of three, then we're in good shape. Now, Couchbase is all these fancy words up here. A lot of people use Couchbase at, in, the, in the beginning as a cache because Couchbase has a very quick caching layer built into it. So a lot of the data lives in memory already. So you can pipe in your relational data into Couchbase and then just use Couchbase as a very, very fast caching mechanism. That's how a lot of people get introduced to it. It can also act as a very simple key value store. So you have a key and a value and you can set them and get them very quickly from that key value store. But Couchbase has more than that. It also has a fully functional document database. <coughs> now what's a document database? It's basically a key value store, except we can actually reason about what's in the value. And typically that means we're storing JSON as the value, JSON documents. And so we can start to write queries that reason about, oh, this document has this field that has this value, and so on. Couchbase also has some really cool embedded database stuff and syncing stuff for mobile devices or embedded type of hardware, IoT. And we'll look at that today as well if we have, if we have time to get to that. The two things that we like to tout at Couchbase is that Couchbase gives you agility and scalability. And so these are some of the things that uh, we think will help you to be more agile in your development. So you have that flexible schema we talked about it's very fast performance, a lot of integration with uh, big data tools. Anybody here use big data type tools, Hadoop or Spark or things like that? Okay, maybe a couple. And then scalability, so the C in couch stands for cluster. So instead of having one SQL machine or one relational database machine that you just upgrade and upgrade and upgrade, you can instead just plug in a whole bunch of commodity machines to form a cluster. And as you do that, you're scaling out your capabilities, just like you do with a web farm, right? You have multiple web servers that you load balance between. You can do the same thing with your database. It's always on. So because we have that cluster, we can pull out one or two nodes, perform maintenance, and the cluster stays up while we're doing that. So we don't have to go down for maintenance, you know, once a week or once a month or whatever. Some other cool things. Uh, the administration UI is very cool. We'll see some of that today. The, um, Multi data center, also known as XDCR, allows you to set up a data center in different geographical locations and sync the data between them. So provide faster performance and better service to people in different regions. It's very cool. And of course, you get all the enterprise grade security stuff, SSL and uh, encryption and all that good stuff there too. Couchbase, I'm gonna talk about .NET and C Sharp tonight. Sorry, I heard some of you talking about VB and I'm not gonna be covering VB, but um, even if you don't use those tools, we have lots of SDKs for all the different languages and frameworks. I'm going to show you Couchbase on server on Windows, but you can also run it on Mac 
and on most popular Linux distros as well. And I mentioned big data earlier. If you're familiar with any of these big data tools, Couchbase probably has some integration ability for you to use. So if you like any of those, Hadoop or Spark up there, you're all set. Now the Couchbase architecture is based on a single node architecture. And what I mean by single node is that each node in the cluster is equally important and you can configure them to be identical. So there's no primary, secondary, there's no master-slave type situation. They're all equal. You can pull one out, they're sort of interchangeable. And they each have a bundle of services on them. So we're looking at data, query, and index. You can choose to swap these between nodes and assign them, or you can choose to have them all identical. We have that caching layer we talked about. You can store things on the disk, the storage layer, Replication is what makes it work between all the different nodes and all the different data centers, in fact. And then the cluster manager, which is how you're going to be interacting with Couchbase as a developer. And the cluster manager does a lot of the work for you, all the some auto sharding and load balancing, things like that. It's all built into the cluster manager. And here's a screenshot of the admin console. This is just a dashboard that shows you how much RAM is being used, how much disk space you have left, all the different nodes that are active, and so on. We'll see that in action later on. If you don't like that UI or you want to integrate with some other tool, there's a REST endpoint, or sorry, REST API that you can use to administer your cluster however you, however you want to. OK, so uh, before I get farther, any questions so far about what I've talked about? I know I've covered this kind of quickly. Anything so far? Anytime you guys think of a question, raise your hand and stop me. That's totally fine. <coughs> so to actually access data in Couchbase, there are three methods. The first method I've kind of already touched on is the, uh, the key access method. And I'll give you a minute here to admire my amazing hand-drawn pictures. That's supposed to be me on the left with the glasses and the big mouth. Now, I, so what I do is I say to Couchbase, I have a key. Give me the document that corresponds to that key. And Couchbase says, OK, here's your document. This operation is generally the fastest, most efficient way to interact with Couchbase because all those documents are typically going to be in RAM. So this is going to be a RAM to RAM exchange. Very, very quick. But however, kind of limited because you only do one document at a time, right? So another thing you can do is, is write a, uh, a view using a MapReduce. Anybody familiar with MapReduce? sometimes abbreviated MR. So what you do is you write uh, a couple of functions. One's called a mapping function. One's called a reducing function. And this will go through all your documents and map certain fields that you want. And then it'll reduce them or do like a filter on them to reduce that set of documents. So in this example here, I've got some people in my database. Those are documents. I want to map to just get their name and their age. So now I have a list of three people with their name and their age. And then I say, OK, reduce that to just the people who are over 21. So now I get a collection that's just Steve and Alyssa. So it's, it's kind of a way of writing a query, but you write it with a map reduce function. And the way you do this in Couchbase is with JavaScript. So you write JavaScript functions, and you install them on the Couchbase uh, cluster. This is pretty common in NoSQL to write map reduce. Do you have a question? So you see this a lot with other NoSQL tools as well. Another thing you can do with Couchbase, and a lot of other tools really, is you can write a SQL query, or what we call in Couchbase nickel query, which is a superset of SQL. And so you can use a query language you're probably familiar with. Who in here is familiar with SQL? Anybody? I just want to get some hands raised. All right. Um, so you can, you can send this query to Couchbase. It will examine those documents for you and return you a result set. Now, a lot of databases, a lot of document databases have a SQL-like query language, but Nickel is that a very complete solution. So you have joins, you have unions, you have all the sorts of keywords you expect to see in SQL, and some additional ones because we're dealing with JSON data, some special cases you need some additional keywords to use. So we'll see some of that in action tonight as well. OK, so now I've given you sort of the nickel tour of Couchbase. That was, that was a pun intended, because the nickel, never mind. Um, 
We're going to talk about, uh, I got one laugh over there. Jeez, tough crowd. Uh, we're going to talk about using the .NET with Couchbase, the .NET SDK. It's available on NuGet. So if you just search for Couchbase Net Client, you'll find it there. This is, at the current time, only compatible with the, the full .NET framework. We have a .NET library, or .NET Core library coming soon. That's one of our top priorities. We're working on it. It's coming. I can't show it to you tonight, though. So this is it's awkward because I don't, I'm used to a screen right here. So this is how we would start by including some. So once we've installed it with NuGet, I'm assuming you've also installed Couchbase Server on your machine. You can install it locally, or you can install it in some other box if you want to. In your C-sharp code, you would include some namespaces, and that's how you get started there. And then this is just sort of a code fragment of the basic way to get connected to a cluster and to start interacting with it. So those first few lines there, you start by creating a client configuration and then giving it the URLs of the nodes in your cluster. Now, in my case, I only have one node, just a local Couchbase server. I'm pointing over here like my computer's over here, but it's actually back there. Couchbase cluster can have multiple nodes in it. So if you had, say, three nodes or ten nodes, you probably want to list them all out here. You don't have to. It can discover them automatically, but if you list them all here, it's going to be a, just a better idea in case something, one of those nodes goes down or something. And then you just initialize that cluster helper. That first part is done typically one time in your application, like the application start in a web app, for instance. Now, once you have a connection to a cluster, the next thing you want to do is identify a bucket. Now, a bucket is a sort of collection of documents in Couchbase. And typically, you have one bucket correspond to one application. All right, so it's, it's not a table. It's not a full database. It's sort of a, a, sub, it's sort of a subdivision of a database. Right? Um, and a, a bucket can contain any number of documents of any different structures. You can have uh, a person document in there, buildings, hospitals, uh, any sort of document you want in there. And this is how you connect to it. You just give it a name. And you can also give it a, you also use a password optionally as well on the bucket. Now the next line there, we're going to explore a little more, but this is how you would start to create a nickel query in .NET. You'd say, okay, here's a string, and we'll pass it to that create, or query request, that create, and then we have a query we can start to execute against Couchbase. Finally, the last portion there is I'm going to create a new document and insert it into a bucket. So I start by doing that in .NET by saying new document of a certain type, now, in this case, I use dynamic just to keep it simple. But you can and probably should use a real C-sharp type in there. So if you created, for instance, a person type, you would say document of type person. Give it an ID. So this is the key for the document. It can be anything you want, any sort of string. And then content represents the document itself. So in this case, I'm using an anonymous object that has two properties, first name, last name. This could be, again, if you're doing a document of type person, you put a person object in here for the content. So once I have that document in place, now I say bucket insert document. And it will go and put that document into Couchbase server for you to retrieve later. Any questions on this so far? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, the keys in a bucket have to be unique, otherwise you'll get an error, especially with insert, right? So if I try to insert a new document that has the same key as another one, that's going to be uh, an error. Um, there's another operation. Sorry. Right. I was trying to figure out what happens when you look for the keys. You're going to get an error, yeah. So you know, in this case, it's a pretty meaningless key, but usually people try to put some meaning in these keys. Or they'll put something like a, a GUID in there, something that's guaranteed to be unique. One more sure. I'm assuming you can use more than one bucket in the same application. Sure. But my question is, if you tend to use one bucket per application, can you share information between two applications? Do they have to be using the same bucket to share information? So when I mentioned earlier, the, so the question is, can you, uh, if you're using a bucket, can you share it between applications? Is that roughly? Like, yeah. Okay. 
So when I said earlier that it's, it's a, a, a bucket per application, that's just a guideline, right? You could certainly have a bucket being shared between multiple applications. There's, there's, as long as they're able to connect to that cluster, there's no, no problems there. Is that required, though, for one for two applications to get to the same data? That, that, that information is stored in that bucket. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, I guess it's okay for two applications to access the same bucket at the same time. Is it okay for two applications to access the bucket at the same time? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Okay, good. All right. Uh, any more questions? Okay. So then, this is just an example of the kind of thing we're going to see more of tonight. I've, I've chosen to make this asynchronous. I'm going to use the Web API and make it asynchronous. You don't have to make it asynchronous. You can make it synchronous. It's totally fine. I thought I'd show off some of the cool async stuff. Anybody used async? Anybody familiar with it? Comfortable with it? You guys are comfortable with it? Let's, let's talk afterwards because I'm totally not. <laughs> But uh, I just wanted to show it here because I also give this talk for Node, and Node does a lot of async stuff. So I figured let's show some async love to .NET too. So anyway, this method here, I'm going to go by go through line by line. We'll start with the signature here. So with async, you have to mark it as async, the method, and it should return something of type task. In this case, I'm returning task of dynamic. It could just be a plain task. And then uh, I'm passing in just one parameter there, which is a string which is going to be a nickel query. Okay? Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, I can't just pass a string directly to Couchbase. I should build a query first, so I'm doing that by passing it into dot .create here. And um, later on, I'm going to show you that you can pass in some parameters as well, so you can parameterize your queries. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my bucket, which is not on the screen here, but trust me, it's uh, defined in the constructor. I'm going to say query, in this, in this case async, and pass that query to it, and I'll get the results back in that results um, object. And that's asynchronous, so it's going to, you know, it's not going to block there if it doesn't have to, but it's going to wait on it for those results to come back. Finally, once those results are back, what I'm interested in is the actual rows of data that it's returning. So that's, it says rows, but it's really a list of objects. And so that's going to return uh, to the calling method, the data. Now, there's other data you can get about the results, like an error code, success, things like that. But rows is what we're interested in in terms of just getting the data out. So uh, any questions on that so far? If you wanted to make this synchronous, just take out the async, take out the task, and take out the await. And that basically be the same code. Oh, and don't use query async. Use just query. <laughs> So I probably should have called this, I probably should have called the method up here query async as well, right? That's the, that's the um, convention, right, to put async on async methods. Okay, so let me show you a quick demo here. It's going to be weird because looking backwards. Okay, so I've written a web app here. And hopefully it'll work. Okay, looks like it's working. So all this app does, it's a simple CRUD application. I'm going to be able to add new people to this list. Let me make that a little bigger. You guys can see it in the back there. Add people to a list. I can edit the people in the list. I can you know, show the whole list of people. And I can delete people in the list. So it's a, it's a very simple sort of CRUD app. It's sort of the first thing you'd, you'd want to try with a new database, right? So I already have one record in here. Last pass figures. So I can add a new item here. Let's say Brian, B Ryan, Brian Cobb. See, this is the problem. Okay, Brian at Brian.org. I don't know. Gov. All right, so I can save that and it shows up in the list. So I've added another user and I can go ahead and delete Brian back out of it. And there's no confirmation or anything. It just immediately deletes him. So not the best, most polished UI. But you can see that that's what I'm going for is sort of a CRUD, a CRUD demo here. I can also edit. So it brings up the current information. I can add some changes. And there we go. So I'll have the source code for this available. We'll go through some of it, but also have it available on GitHub. So you guys can download this and play with it yourself. 
sort of the most simple thing you can do with this, full, this sort of full stack. All right. Which one is the slide deck? All right, back over here. Okay. So I want to talk to you not about the mean stack because that's uh, one of our, our competitors, but the, the keen stack or the, or the scene stack, right? So typically it's Mongo Express Angular Node. That's the mean stack. Our keen stack is it's Couchbase instead of Mongo. <coughs> but this is a .NET group, right? We're not going to use Node. We're not going to use Express. So I swapped out the equivalent in, our, in the .NET world. So instead of Express, we're going to use Web API. Anybody familiar with uh, Web API? It's kind of like MVC, but for REST endpoints, OK? Uh, and then instead of Node, we're going to use ASP.NET slash IIS. Once we switch to .NET Core, it'll be ASP.NET Core and was it Kestrel? Is that what they're calling it? The new, new web server? Or maybe it'll be IS, I don't know. And then Angular, anybody familiar with Angular in here? One, two, okay, good. So you guys, most of you won't know that I don't know what I'm doing with Angular. That's good. All right, so the idea with this kind of stack is Compared to a traditional stack, all the UI stuff is on the front end. So we're talking all the JavaScript, of course, all the HTML, but all the templates as well. So we're not using Razor or anything like that on, this, on the server side. We're using all client-side templates. And that's just interacting with the back end via some REST endpoints that return JSON data. And those are served up via Web API on the back end. So we have this sort of clear delineation between the front end and back end. So if I decided to switch to something like React or something else on the front end, just plain jQuery, I could use the same endpoints as I was using before, and vice versa. Furthermore, I could take those endpoints and use them across multiple different UIs. So my, webs, my web app, of course, I could have my mobile app call those same APIs, or some sort of, uh, some sort of Xbox game or whatever you wanted to, to write. So if I make a purchase via the browser, it's going to show up on my, on my mobile app because it's using the same APIs. So let's take a look at that Web API backend next. Again, we're going to do some async. Let's start with the um, web config file. I've added a couple entries to this. One of them is just a link to the, uh, the, the node, the Couchbase node. It's part of my cluster and the name of the bucket I'm going to use. I'm just going to put this in the config file. You don't have to do this this way, but that's what I'm doing. And the bucket is called RESTful Sample. I think actually my demo is called Default, but it doesn't matter. You can call it whatever you want to. And then in my global ASAX file, this is sort of the where you do your application start, set up code. Those first five lines should look pretty familiar to you if you've ever done one of these before, done a file new web API. That sets up all the routes and all the bundling and the areas and stuff. So that's not, that's not new. But under that, down here, this is the Couchbase setup. We saw some of this earlier. I'm just doing a new client configuration, passing in the URL that's from the config file. And then I'm saying, well, use SSL's false because I'm just using it locally. There's no certificate on my machine. And then I'm saying cluster helper initialize. So I'm passing this config to the cluster helper. From that point on, I can use cluster helper throughout my app to connect to buckets and interact with Couchbase. Any questions on this startup code so far? Okay, good, good, good. And then uh, just application end, I want to clean up the connection, so I say cluster helper close. So when the app restarts or goes down or whatever, it'll release those resources. All right, so let's start by writing a controller. And this is a web API controller. You can tell because it inherits from API controller. I'm just going to show you the constructor here. I'm going to say, new me up a record model. We haven't created that class yet. We'll get to it. But instantiate a new record model. Record model will be how we interact with Couchbase. And I'm just making that a, a property of the controller. It's called underscore model. All right. So here's our first endpoint. And this is going to be an endpoint that's responsible for saving new or updated persons in our app. All right? This is asynchronous again, so we have async keyword on there. This is a post endpoint, so we'll be posting to this from the browser. 
I've also chosen to use the route attribute on here to specify the exact route you need to go to to use this endpoint. You don't have to do that. You could use the route configuration that I showed you a few screens back. But I think this helps demonstrate you know, where exactly this endpoint is going to be and you know, how to use, how to access that endpoint. So what we'd expect is the Angular app to post a person object to this endpoint. I'm going to go through and do some validation on it to make sure that everything is required. Otherwise, we'll return a 400 saying, no, you didn't supply the first name. It's a bad request. In the end, we'll call that model and do a save on the body that came in. So we're just going to save that person object directly. And we'll await that because that's, again, an asynchronous method. So I should have called save async. I regret that now. I'll go back and change it later. Any questions on this so far? Looking pretty good. Who was using the web API? Remember a couple of you guys? OK. All right. OK, so that's the save endpoint for creating or updating. Now here's one for actually getting a document. So when we edit a person, we need to first get their existing information to show it to the user and make changes. Very simple. We're just expecting a GUID being passed in. So I'm using GUIDs for the keys in this system here. Nothing special about it, just, just a unique GUID. And if one's not passed in, we'll have to say, well, you didn't send me the document ID I want, so that's a bad request. Otherwise, I will just call the get by document ID and return the document to the endpoint, to Angular that's calling it. So this is a get request. I didn't specify that explicitly, but by default, they're gets, unless you say it's post. And this is the API slash get route. OK, here's the delete endpoint. Hopefully, you're starting to see a pattern here. Uh, again, using a route attribute. Uh, it's a post action, expecting the entire person to be posted. We really only care about the document ID, but for convenience, we're expecting the whole person to be posted. They must pass in a document ID. Otherwise, it's a bad request. And then otherwise, we'll pass in the document ID to the delete method, which will Couchbase will then go and delete the document. So far, so good. So there's one more endpoint. I'm not going to show it to you just yet. We can look at it later. But now let's look at the actual um, record model class. I should have put that at the top there. This is the record model class that we've been calling, the save method. So this is doing something very similar to what we saw early on. It's taking in that person object. In this case up here, in this ID line, what I'm saying is, was a document ID specified? If so, this is we're going to use that ID. Otherwise, we want to create a new ID. So GUID dot new new GUID there, and that means we're going to be creating a new document. So we're going to create a new ID for that. And then the content I'm mapping to an anonymous object, which is some left hand right hand code. I don't want to pass in the object directly because I'd be opening myself up for abuse of my endpoint, putting all kinds of crazy data in my document. So I'm mapping explicitly. I expect first name, last name, email. And finally, I'm saying this, this type of document I'm saving is user. Now type is nothing special about type. It's just an arbitrary field I've chosen to put in my documents to differentiate them from other kinds of documents in the database. And finally, I'm calling the upsert, upsert async method. Any guesses what upsert does? based on the name. What's that? Exactly. So it creates a new one. If it's not there, that's the cert part, the insert. Or it updates an existing document if it is there. It's the up part, the update. So it's a combination update, insert. If you use uh, explicit insert or explicit update, it's going to not quite work for this situation because it would error if it exists or doesn't exist, depending on which one it is. So once we call that method, we'll end up with a document in Couchbase that looks very much like this. So there's, there's the key right on there, 8597, et cetera. That's the GUID. That's the key to the document. The rest is the body of the document. It's just a JSON object. There's the data I've entered to the form. And it's also got that additional type user field there. All right, so now 
we're, we're in our app. We've added a bunch of documents. Let's um, let's look at oh, let's look at one more. Let's look at the get by document ID. So now we want to pull out that document based on the ID that's been given to us. So here is one way you could do it. This method is again asynchronous. A GUID's being passed in. I'm constructing a nickel query. So I'm just select, select the first name, last name, email, which are the fields in the document there. First name, last name, email. Selecting those from the bucket name. So that's a configuration setting. Earlier it was called what RESTful sample or REST sample. And then I'm aliasing that bucket as users. That's sort of optional. You don't have to alias it. Then I'm saying where meta users ID. Now the meta is uh, specific to nickel. That's not something you see in SQL. What I'm saying there is, give me some metadata about the document that I'm querying. And one of those pieces of information is the key. So it's called ID in this case, but where meta.id equals dollar sign one, and that's a parameter. So basically I'm saying, give me all the documents that have this specific key. So then I pass it into query request.create. Next thing I do is call add positional parameter. So that's going to substitute dollar sign one for the document ID. Because yes, you can do SQL injection in a NoSQL database. So you should always parameterize your queries. And then I just pass that query and await the result and return the rows. So, where do I get the bucket name from? So in this case, it's just a variable, but um, it's from that configuration file I showed you earlier. The, that uh, web duck and fig. So I'm not sanitizing bucket name in this query because it's coming from a config file, so I'd be injecting myself, which would be kind of weird, I guess. So I'm not worried about it. Okay, now uh, before I go on, I should note don't do this because um, what we're doing is we're querying for just one document that has this key. There's a much faster way to do this, just do bucket.get, right? So this is just to sort of show off some really basic nickel. I'm going to show you some more complex nickel in a minute, but here is one more method. This is the delete method, and all I'm doing is say bucket.remove, and I pass in the document ID. Is everyone familiar with this new C-sharp syntax, this little arrow here? It's basically the equivalent of, of this, just a little less ceremony. That's a, that's a C-sharp 6 feature, C-sharp 5 feature. These are identical, what they do. So, okay. All right, so now we'll take a quick look at Angular, and everybody who's Angular, close your eyes, because I know this is probably going to look horrible to you. Uh, but just want to give you the idea of what's going on. So here's my Angular app.js file. And I'm creating this fetch all method on the scope. So it's going to hit that endpoint we created, the get all endpoint, which I don't know if I showed you that specific endpoint. But it's going to return all the documents. And then success promise there is going to go through the result and say, OK, all those items are going to add them to the scope items collection. So I can then display them to the, the page, the screen. And then here is. Um, it's basically the same thing, but it's a save function. I'm going to post to that API save endpoint. I'm going to post that specific data. Now, in this case, if we're creating a new person, that document ID will not be defined. So we'll be passing an undefined to the endpoint, but that's okay. We handled that already. We checked to see if the ID was set or not. So if we pass undefined there, it's going to assume we're creating a new document. So no problem there. Okay, so how was that for Angular? Does that look right, look terrible? I appreciate your feedback afterwards if you guys want to rip apart my Angular so I can prove it for next time. Okay, so now once we, we've got through the, uh, the UI, let's, let's go back to Nickel a little bit, look at some more complex queries as done in C-sharp. So this is using a different bucket. It's called the travel sample bucket. Uh, I guess I should have put that up there instead of this configuration. So this is how I get that bucket name out of configuration, by the way. Configuration manager. But Couchbase Server comes with a sample data set called Travel Sample. So it's kind of like Northwind, if you guys are familiar with Microsoft's sample. 
but it contains like, I don't know, 30,000 documents that contain like airports and routes and landmarks and things like that. So for traveling, it's sort of a more realistic example of a, a complex data set than my simple first name, last name, email. So in this example here, I've created a method to find all the routes between two airports. So this is using a union, it's something you don't see in a lot of NoSQL databases. It's, excuse me, the ability to union two queries results together. So I'm saying, give me all the documents that have an airport name of you know, the first parameter, and then union them with all the documents that have an airport name of the second parameter. So I could, for instance, get all the routes that are from San Francisco and to Miami, and union them together to get the geo coordinates of those, of those airports. Well, I guess this wouldn't be, this wasn't my routes, this is actual airports, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. This is getting all the airports and their geolocation, their coordinates. I'm using the add positional parameters again to do some parameterization and querying, same as before. So the at symbol here, the at symbol? The at symbol, okay. So the at symbol is also a C-sharp thing, it just allows me to have a string on multiple lines without having to use, you know, quote plus at the end of each line. All right. Here's even more complex. So now this is the routes I was talking about. So I want to find all the routes from airport from to airport two and on a specific day. So that's the leave variable up there, which is zero through six, which is Monday through Saturday. So I'm doing a couple of things in this query. I'm going to show this in a little more, uh, a little more in action here, if I can crane my neck around to look at the screen. But uh, the idea here is that we're showing a join so I'm selecting from documents and joining them to that same bucket, different kinds of documents. In this case, I'm selecting all the, all the, um, all the routes. I'm joining those routes to airport, to, um, uh, what do you call them? To the actual airline names, the airline, so like American and United. So each route has sort of a foreign key to airlines. And then I'm getting them from the source to the destination, and I'm saying on that specific day. I'm doing one more thing in here, this unnest keyword, because in those documents, the schedule field is actually itself an array. It's a collection of different flights on that day. So you have a route, which is San Francisco to Miami, and then you have maybe 10 flights, or you know, 20 flights a week on that list. So maybe it'll help to see this a little more in action here. If I can bring this up here. So to access the admin console is typically port 8091. And I've just got it running locally here. Let me type in my amazingly secure password. And I'm going to need uh, this one. Okay. So here is the, and it's a little big, but here is the uh, Couchbase console is sort of showing us, these are live queries about operations per second, how many times it's going to the disk. If I can click on nodes, I can see how many nodes I have. It's only one in this case, but if I have a, a bunch, you see the whole list of them here. You know, their status, are they up? What services do they have? What's their RAM usage and so on? This is a list of buckets. So I have travel sample. It has 30, about 32,000 documents in it. This is this comes with Couchbase server, so you can install it yourself and play around with this, this data. Here's the default bucket I was using for my a little Angular app. And we can, if we go in that, we can see that I have the one document in there, just like I showed you on the screenshot there. And let's go over to Query tab next. So this is one of my favorite new features. This is a, they just released this, actually, this Query tab, and I would be lost without it, because otherwise I have to do the command line and use the whole thing. I much prefer this interface. It's, it reminds me a lot of SQL, um, SQL Development Studio, or SQL SSMS or whatever. So anyway, let's bring up my notes here. So I'm going to start with this. And I'll make sure you guys can read this in the back there. You see that back there okay? Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm saying select documents from this bucket. I'm going to call that R, aliasing is R, just like you alias a table in SQL. I want to join on the same bucket, 
but I'm going to call that A. I'm going to join on the documents that have keys that correspond to, correspond to the airline ID. So each, of, each document could have a field in it called airline ID that links it to a specific airline. And I'm saying, give me all the routes that have uh, source San Francisco and destination Miami, and order them by the airline name. So this is A dot name. So execute this. And what I end up with is down here. So the raw result is, is JSON like this. But I can show it in the table view as well, which might help you visualize this a little better. So this is a row right here. Destination Miami. This is the, I guess, the airplane ID or something. Uh, I join it to the airline itself, so I have this, this uh, name and source airport field. Here's the schedule. So it's an embedded, you can think of it like an embedded table, but it's a, an embedded array of uh, flights. And then the source airport. So that's the first one, American Airlines. Here's the next one, which is U.S. Airways, and all their flights from Miami to Chicago, or to San Francisco. I'm sorry, San Francisco to Miami source destination, okay? So that's kind of cool. We can get that result back. We can get that sort of embedded collection of schedules. But maybe I want to flatten that out a little bit and make it a little more like a relational result. So what I could do is I could use the unnest keyword here. And so instead of our schedule, showing this sort of thing. I want to unnest our schedule. All right, so I'm just saying unnest our schedule and un unnest it as uh, into S. Or, yeah. So execute that. Now what you'll see is it's flattened it out. And it's, sort of, it's sort of like a join, right? You're joining that hierarchy which exists in the document to the results. And here's the raw JSON, what it looks like. It's very flat JSON. The table view is a little easier to see. So there's the American Airlines, and there's the US Airways. So instead of two rows, now I have 52 rows. And you can see the only columns that really vary are the, the flight number and the, uh, the time of the flight. OK, now I can take it a step further and say, well, I want only want the ones that are on Sunday. So I'll just add another part to the where clause here and say, well, day equals Sunday. All right, so I've got down to now nine different possible flights I could take on Sunday from San Francisco to Miami. So I, I think this is one of the cool things that attracted me to Couchbase is you have this, you guys already have this ability to write SQL queries. I've been using SQL my whole career. So if you have that knowledge, you can take it and apply it to Couchbase which is a NoSQL database, but you already have the skills to write the queries that you need for your software. Anyway, that's what I like about it. Any questions on, on this? So I've got, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so the question is, if you have a lot of nested hierarchies, what's the syntax to extract them out? Um, the answer is, yeah, basically a, a dot notation. And um, it's, it's very much like a JSON path to it. So if you have an array, you can use indexes on it. Um, there's, there's lots of, I mean, this is what makes it a superset, is that there's some additional tools that wouldn't make sense in a SQL database that you can apply to a JSON uh, document. So there's definitely those. I'm not going to go into those too much detail today. I will give you a link if you're interested. We have an online interactive tutorial. It takes you through some of the cool stuff about Nickel. So you can, you can check that out. So the JSON there, though, is actually the data portion of that. That's not like the, is in there also a JSON, essentially the call, like the SQL? Does that convert, or am I thinking off base? Um, I, I don't quite. Um, Understand. So, could you? Well, is JSON also a basically a query? Is it like a language to, to make the request? Uh, in this case, no. The, okay. the, what, the, what we're making the request with is the actual that the nickel syntax right. up there, yeah. SQL query. But does that get converted to something else? That's all I'm after, I guess. Uh, you know, behind the scenes, it might get converted to some sort of 
something. That, I mean, this is written in, Couchbase is written in Erlang and Go, combination languages, so I'm sure they... What's the actual underlying, you know, the native thing for Couchbase, I guess? Yeah. Oh, so, well, I mean, so I've, there's, there's that uh, map reduce query I told you about earlier, but that's, right. that's separate from Nickel. So Nickel is a whole separate engine that Couchbase wrote for Couchbase 4 um, that's, that just added to the, language, added to the server itself. So, so there's, a, there's a parsing engine that handles this query, and, and uh, there's a, um, one of the services that kind of gloss, glossed over this. But if you look at the server nodes, there's this query service, and that's what's responsible for uh, coming up with execution plans to go through these documents and indexing, or using indexes, things like that. Okay. Um, to do like sort of procedures, or that just be like saving the text of a query in a file? So the question was, is there a way to store procedures? Um, so um, the short answer is no. Longer answer is a map reduce view is kind of like a store procedure in that you could write a store procedure that's just a select that returns information. There's not any concept of a store procedure that will mutate data that's actually stored on Couchbase server. So that stuff's going to live in your application code now. What's the speed? So is it, is it compared? Like, what's the, I guess the one thing I kind of struggle with with this is like, when does it make sense to go this way versus like, what's better about this than relational? I mean, I understand, the, <laughs> I understand the cluster and I understand, yeah. I mean, is it, to me, it seems kind of like maybe it's less efficient, but you can throw more nodes at it. Mm. I'm not sure. Like, so the response on that was like 700 milliseconds. Yeah. I don't know how many records there were, but that's a pretty slow response for yeah. such a small set. Yeah. I mean, it could be like 20 milliseconds or something, like you know, or 10 on Oracle or something. Okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not criticizing or anything. I'm just struggling yeah. to kind of understand, like what. <clears throat> I'm a little leery about, um, you know, fads. I've just seen too sure. many of them over the years. No, sure. Passwords and things like that don't really. Yeah. You know, everybody thinks that this is like a cure all and everything. Sure. No, fair enough. And, and absolutely. So the question basically is, you know, what's the benefit of this as opposed to a relational database? Is the performance there? And those are a lot of really broad, deep yeah, questions. Uh, no, that's, that's totally fine. But I mean, like, if you have a small, if you have a small app, is yeah. it, like, does it make more sense to do this? Or is that, is that the strength of it? Like, uh, you don't have to, you know, install a big, kick up a new instance of, you know, I don't know, is this open source? Or oh, is sure, open source? I should have mentioned that earlier on. This Couchbase server, all the Couchbase products I'm showing you are open source. Um, so, I mean, don't look at the, the millisecond time on my machine because it's locally and you know, there's lots of resources competing. There are some, we just released, in fact, a, a round of benchmarks using uh, third party and third party benchmarking uh, solutions that can sort of show you the, the speed benefits you'll get. From, from using Couchbase as compared to other NoSQLs and also compared to relational databases. Maybe it's only as good as your indexing. Like that's also with, true. With that, relational, that's the way it is. Right, that's also true. Indexing is an important part of this, especially in NoSQL, because I have one bucket now that has documents of all kinds, right? As opposed to relational, I'm indexing a specific table. Now I've got to index you know, documents in a whole bucket. So it's very important to have the correct indexing on, uh, on, on those buckets. And, that's a, we spend a lot of time in the forums trying to figure out, oh, which, you're writing this query, is it hitting the right index or is it hitting sort of the equivalent of a table scan, right? Is the indexing and the execution plans as rich as in a relational? You know, like is it, it gets you know, really involved, like say, with Oracle or SQL Server with the execution plans. And right, so the question is, is, is the indexing and, and um, um, execution yeah. plans as rich I mean, as SQL? I would say that definitely, if not more so. I mean, there's... Like you alluded to earlier, the sort of embedded levels you can go in a document, you can apply indexing to that. You can index, you know, uh, arrays that are in documents, things like that. So there's definitely a lot of rich indexing capabilities there. Um, so, but basically, to, to answer your question in sort of another broad way, is that there is no silver bullet. You're absolutely right. And you should be wary of, of anything that you're using just because it's a fad, right? So, um, but I think there's a lot of things you can do with Couchbase. Um, like I mentioned early on, a lot of people start using it as a cache, as a way to, you know, you pipe your relational database, you transform it and put it into Couchbase, and then you can do very, very fast memory to memory, just sort of retrieving a document with a single key. Um, 
you know, some, some of our customers are using it for a full operational database, and some are using it just for the, the caching part. So there's lots of things you can do with, with Couchbase and, and other NoSQL databases. So I'd, I'd love to discuss it with you more over, I guess we're going somewhere afterwards for, for uh, libations and snacks. So I'd love to discuss it with you some more afterwards. Same goes for all of you, by the way. Okay, uh, where was I? Any more questions before I switch back to the slides? I think I only have a few more left in the server department here. So there is the source code for the, the sort of basic CRUD app I showed you. It's on GitHub. Uh, it's in Couchbase Labs. Lots of other cool stuff on Couchbase Labs, by the way, if you're interested in checking it out. And uh, if you have any questions on how to use that, how to set it up, I'd be glad to help you. I have my contact info up later. Um, so I encourage you to go check that out. And that's that nickel, nickel query tutorial I was talking about. If you're interested, it's interactive. You can go and, and play with that tutorial online, get to know nickel a little better, and there you go. OK, uh, one more thing, uh, link to Couchbase. So if you guys are using SQL, you might be using an ORM like nHibernate or Entity Framework. Anybody using those? Only a couple. OK, wow. So with I, sh I showed you Nickel, so SQL-like query language. And with Entity Framework, what you're doing is essentially it's generating SQL queries for you. This is something very similar. It it's gives you a link provider for Couchbase, so you can generate queries using link syntax. So one way you might do that, there's, by the way, Link to Couchbase is also open source. It's not officially supported yet by Couchbase, so it's just sort of an experimental thing at this point. But I've used it, and it's pretty darn cool. You can start by creating a, a class to represent an, an, a document or entity. And you could put this document type filler, so that's part of Link to Couchbase up there. And we'll see why that might be helpful in a second. But we can say, oh, this document is the type is of type airline, all right? And then I can put on um, some of the properties of that document that I'm interested in mapping to. And I'm ignoring the ID up there because that's going to correspond to the key of the document. I don't necessarily want that in the document itself. You could if you wanted to, but that's going to be part of the metadata of the document. And then with that, I could, for instance, write a, a query with link to Couchbase like this. I can say, you know, query all the airlines and give me the, the names. So this would return a list of United, United Air, a list of string probably, uh, United Air, American Airlines, and so on. Now, if you go back to up here, if you didn't put that document type filter up there, you would have to use that line that I put a strike through. Otherwise, it's going to attempt to take every document and map it to uh, an airline object. And we only want the ones that are marked as type airline. So that's how you do that in Link to Couchbase. And that's all I'm going to show with Link to Couchbase because it's just, like I said, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's out there. It's not officially supported. But if you like Link, uh, link providers, this is the one that we, we have going for us. So any questions on that? All right. Oh. Just real quick. Sure. Um, earlier you said that type was just a tool that you were using. Mm-hmm. Right. So for the purposes of linked to Couchbase, it is kind of special. But in general, Couchbase server doesn't treat it like anything special, at least not, at least not yet. Good question. So I'll just repeat the question um, in case you didn't hear. He was wondering uh, if type isn't a special field, then why does this document type filter sort of assume that type is a special field? And that's because linked to Couchbase does, but um, Couchbase itself does not. Okay. All right, so that is all the Couchbase server stuff I've got. Now, I have some other mobile stuff I can show you if you guys are interested, if I have time, uh, to show you how Couchbase mobile works and how Sync Gateway works. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. I'm not really the mobile advocate guy, so I just kind of am showing you some stuff that they prepared for me, um, some code samples and things. If you have really tough mobile questions, I'd be happy to uh, forward them on. I can probably answer some of the easier ones. So. Are we good to show the mobile stuff? Anybody not want to see it? Okay. All right, cool. 
All right, so um, Couchbase Mobile consists of three parts. These are all open source, by the way. So Couchbase Lite is an embedded database. It sits on your device. It's, uh, you know, it, you don't have to be connected to a network to use it. It just sits there on your device. You can write data to it in no SQL fashion. Sync Gateway is separate from Couchbase Server, and it will actually facilitate synchronization between the embedded databases. So if I have some data on my device and I'm syncing, it'll show up on your device and vice versa. And then you can actually connect Sync Gateway optionally to Couchbase Server to persist that, that data. All right, so Couchbase Lite, you can kind of think of this as a replacement for SQLite. It's, uh, it's pretty lightweight. I think it's around 400K is the sort of footprint we're looking at. And you can use this on all these mobile and embedded logos up here. Anybody using any of these logos? Anybody familiar with these logos? <coughs> Xamarin is what we'll look at tonight because that's the, that's the .NET one. But uh, PhoneGap, Unity, uh, Objective-C, Android, Java, maybe Swift. I think Swift is supported. You can also embed it into Mac apps and Linux apps and Windows apps if you wanted to. iPhone? Yeah, uh, did I say Objective-C? Yeah. I iOS, Objective-C, yeah, Object and, and possibly Swift. Sync Gateway is just sort of, it can be another cluster of servers that you can um, have those Couchbase Lite databases connect to and sync with. They don't have to know any th specifics about how it's syncing or what it's doing. They can just say, okay, I'm syncing with you. And, and the sync it doesn't need to know about all the individual phones. It can just, it just sort of picks them up as they, they connect to the network. So they're not really tightly coupled. And you can use uh, all kinds of authentication. You can write your own. You can use Facebook, Persona, some other <coughs> ones, I think. You can use to authenticate to the sync gateway. And server is what we've been talking about most of the session. You can choose to back Sync Gateway with Couchbase Server. So Couchbase Lite. These are the features we're going to talk about here, these four pretty icons. Uh, it's a NoSQL database, just like Couchbase. It has MapReduce capabilities for querying. It has some eventing built in, which is, which is pretty cool, and uh, synchronization. So here is some Xamarin code. Uh, a little snippet to give you an idea of how you'd interact with Couchbase if you're writing a Xamarin app in C Sharp. So we'd start by, well, I'm showing you some, I'm sort of skipping a few things. You first have to set up a shared instance, and that's going to vary depend on, depending on if you're writing with um, Android or, or iOS. But once you have that set up, you can just say shared instance.get database and pass it a string. It will then either create that database if it doesn't exist, or it will get uh, you know, a, a variable to that database that already exists. And then now once I have that database, I can create a document in the database by just saying create document. And then with that document, I can put properties. And then properties expects a, a dictionary. What's going to ultimately do with what I pass into that put properties is serialize it to JSON. So as long as whatever objects you're passing in are serializable to JSON, it'll store that in a, a NoSQL document, much like we saw with Couchbase server. And that's it. Put properties and your document is saved to your local database. So to actually query the data back out, we don't have nickel yet in Couchbase Lite, but we do have map reduce indexes. The cool thing about these is you can actually, with Couchbase server, you build them in JavaScript. With Couchbase Lite, you can build them in whatever language you're using to interact with Couchbase. So I'm writing C sharp, I can write a C sharp MapReduce query. And this allows me to actually set a breakpoint in the MapReduce code as well, so I can debug through it quite easily. So an example of that is here I'm going to create a view. I'm going to call that view people. So again, it's going to either get existing view or create a new one called people. I'm going to set the MapReduce code, which is in this case a, like a delegate that takes in uh, a, one document at a time and passes in, you, passes in the emitter for you. So that code that I've, I've written in there, the if and the emit, that's your MapReduce code. I'm saying if the document contains a Twitter field, then emit that document. So what I'm saying here is that if you don't have a Twitter account, you're not a person. 
And then once I've created that view, now I'm going, I can go and execute that view. So I can start by saying get existing view, and it's called people. And then I'll create a query off that view and run the query. And that'll give me some rows back as a result. I can loop through and do whatever I want with those results. There's some other cool options here, like a live query, I think is what they call it, which gives you an observable collection, which we'll see in action here in a bit, assuming, I, assuming it'll work. And so that way, you'll, you'll get some more live updates, some of the cooler stuff you can do um, you know, as the data changes. Change notifications. So you can, instead of just constantly polling your database to see if something's different, you can set up a change event. So if something happens, you can respond to it. This will cut down a lot of the sort of excess code you normally write with a SQLite database, something like that. You can set up events for data, uh, queries, some replications, which we'll see in a bit here. And basically anything in the document database that happens, you can set up an event for it. So here's an example of one that responds to anything in the database changing. So we set up an event with typical C sharp plus equals syntax there. Inside that event, we'll loop through the changes array that comes in through the args. So this is not handling one change at a time. It could handle a whole batch of changes. It could handle a whole bunch at one time. We'll loop through each one. And then we can see what actually changed and do something about it. So in this case, I'm saying, is it a conflict? Is that the change that was made? We'll see what, what conflicts mean in a second here. If it's a conflict, then maybe we want to log it. We want to resolve it somehow. We want to you know, do, something, do something else. Prompt the user to, to resolve the conflict. You know, whatever you want to do. We can also check to see, is it a delete? So change.isDelete. And lots of things you can, you can tell about that change here in the event. So let's get to syncing now. If I set up a sync gateway, then I get the ability to have a full multi-master replication. What that means is that every database that's connected to Couchbase or to Sync Gateway is considered the master, right? So they'll, all, they'll be synchronized all across the board, all those devices. We have some ability to control how much we're draining the battery. So we could be constantly syncing, and that's going to use a lot of battery, or we could set it to be something that doesn't sync as often but doesn't use the battery up as much. So here's an example of how to set up your app to talk to Sync Gateway. We can set up push or pull, or both. We just pass it the URL of the Sync Gateway. And then the continuous there is basically that's our, our, our knob for working with battery draining. So it's continuously checking. It's going to be more up to date, but it's going to use more battery. So that's your option there. Then you just kick them off. You say push start, pull start. Oh, this fancy slide they gave me. So anyone know what those two things on the left are? I think there's some sort of Java thing. I don't know. But NuGet is where you can get it for your Xamarin apps. It's also open source. You can build it yourself on GitHub. OK. I'm going to turn my keyboard sideways here, if you guys don't mind. Just let me do this one. I'll show you, hopefully, something cool with the mobile apps. So, all right, what I've got here is, this is a PowerShell window, and I'm just running the sync gateway right now in the PowerShell window. So it's like a DOS, DOS window sort of thing. I also have two emulators here running Android, and I've installed this sample app, this to-do list app on both <laughs> those Android machines. So it's kind of weird because they're, I mean, it's, it's one machine, but it's acting as like three different machines at this point. So I'll open up these sample apps, which by the way, it's source code. I'll have a link for you in a minute here. Say next and next. And those are the credentials. So log in. You can see that the sync is going crazy back there because I'm logging into the sync gateway. And right now they're synced up. So I have these to-do list called test. I thought I'd get rid of those, but we'll add another one in here. Call it fanug. Create that list. So once I do that, 
it gets synced up to the device on, on the other emulator. So then go into this one and say, I don't know, uh, get milk. Add to do item. I meant to bring this one up too, but should have get milk. So let's uh, do this and get beer. Okay, and they, they sync up. So these are both talking to that one sync gateway machine, but I'm not doing any sort of special code here to, um, you know, to hook them up. I'm just writing to the database on this one, writing to the database on this one, and they're communicating with the sync gateway. So I have the sample code for that available if you guys are interested. But any, any questions on that? Yeah. Um, multiple sync gateways. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know why you'd want to use multiple sync gateways. But the the idea is, I think I showed you on the on the slides here, the app talks to the sync gateway with this code right here. So I'm saying, I'm gonna I want to do some push replication with the sync gateway at that address, and I'll do pull with with that address, something like that. Yeah. That URL. Mm -hmm. So, and this, actually, locally, right now, it's not sync gateway. This is just a dummy here. Locally, I think I've got it, because I'm using GennyMotion to emulate, it's actually something like 10.0.3, uh, no, 3.2 or something like that, and it's port 4984. That's how it would actually look. Um, I don't know. I guess you could. I'm not sure what that would give you because you'd be they'd be syncing the same data. So uh, maybe for like if you had a sync gateway in the West Coast, one on the East Coast, that might make sense. I don't know. It seems like you'd be kind of maybe fragmenting the data. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, they'd be communicating indirectly through your mobile phone, right? So yeah. it would be kind of. They would be syncing to your phone, and then your phone would be syncing to both of them. So it, that would be a that would be kind of a strange setup, but I I suppose you could do it. <laughs> it's okay. We can come back if you want to. Okay. So any more? Mobile questions. You got it now. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Um, so, is it always talking to the couch-based device on your device, even if you're continuously connected? Is, is it always doing it to your local database and then syncing, or mm -hmm. is it directly communicate through the gateway? So, my understanding is that when you, the question is, is it always communicating with with uh, with sync gateway? My understanding is that. You communicate with Couchbase Lite, okay. and then you've configured Couchbase Lite to talk to the sync gateway. So that's why if my connection goes out or something, my, my code will work. Right, so if your connection goes out, exactly. So if you're offline for whatever, you're in a bad uh, spot, or your Wi-Fi goes out or whatever, you're still saving that data to your local database. And once you get connection again, it will sync up. Yeah, so you're asking about conflicts. Yeah. Right, so, um, you know, you can, you can, well, that's up to you, really, to, de to, de to define that. So you can define, like I showed you before, a, a change method locally if there's a conflict. So if there's a conflict between your data and what's coming from Couchbase, I believe there's also a way you can define on Sync Gateway itself how to handle conflicts. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I, I think there's a way you can do that on the Couchbase Sync machine. So there's definitely lots of, con that's definitely an important thing, lots of conflict handling. But there's no, there's no I don't think there's any default handling of conflict. You have to define that because it varies a lot based on what you're trying to do, if you're pushing, pulling, both, et cetera. Yeah, really good question. I can, if you're really interested, I can give you someone who knows a lot more about the conflict stuff than me. Yes, that's correct. The two databases are local to each device. So, put a whole bunch of records in, you start a new device up, it's going to 
sync all of that data across a bunch of So the question is, if you put a whole bunch of records in and then open up a new database, it's going to sync all those records at one time. I, I don't know if it, it's like one big dump or not, or if it's like just incremental little bits. I, I'm not sure about that. It's a good question. Sure. Yeah, if you have a new device, you want it to get that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> you don't want it to just, you know, get send a two gig, you know, request or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's not just one big, like if you have two gig database or something, it's not going to send that over the wire at once. But I'm not, I'm not sure the details of what exactly it's doing. So I can definitely look into that for you. My bigger question is, while it's doing that, can it be working? Oh, yeah, oh, sure. So the question is, can you be working? It's not going to be synchronous, right? So it's still, you can still work while it's happening in the background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that stay on your device, or every time I go to the web page, does it re-download that? So the so the question is, is that 400k stay on your device? And yeah, I think it's a 400k, basically like a library, like a, like kind of like a DLL that you're adding to your app. Is it just the cache of my device, or is it like some sort of? I mean, in other words, if I don't go to that website for a few days and then I go back to it, does it have to re-download it, or is it just sync up what I already have? So it, it's kind of like. Um, it's part of your app code, basically. It, so it's, it's adding on to the size of your, your APK in Android or, or whatever, your jar file, what have you. So that's just the footprint of the actual database itself. It's kind of like, I don't know what Android has, but I do know on Apple products, they have their own dictionary. That you, you, know, you can connect up to. So it's kind of the same scenario. It's just that dictionary is what Couchbase is sitting on the device. Yes. Right. Right, exactly. Exactly. Okay. They always warn me I get a lot of mobile questions, and I never thought I would actually be the case, but people are really interested in this kind of stuff, so that's cool. Okay. Um, that's about all I got, actually, on the mobile stuff. So, I'll put up some more. Yeah, we saw that already. Yep, yep, all that. Okay. So, this is the source code that I showed you tonight. This has the Xamarin app and also has the sync gateway config file. Uh, so all, everything you need is there to get it going. I think there's a typo that I submitted a pull request for. But that, other than that, it's, I'm using the exact same code that um, you'd get from GitHub there. And there's other samples if you're interested in native script or iOS. They're all up there too. But I thought I'd just focus on the .NET example for the .NET group. All right. Um, if any of you guys posted some tweets or you just really want a sticker, come and talk to me afterwards. I can give you one of these cool looking sticker logos here. Uh, I only have a few with me, so uh, I'm going to give priority to those who tweeted something good. And then next place, someone tweeted something badly, something, uh, something angry. You can still get a sticker. Here's our contact info for our developer community group. Um, we have uh, this cool developer portal, so if you're interested in server or mobile, that's a good place to start. Blog.couchbase.com. Me and the rest of the people on my team, we all blog there regularly, so go and read our cool blogs. Follow us on Twitter. Our Couchbase dev account is sort of the one that we control, then Couchbase is the main Twitter account. If you want to ask something about Couchbase, we monitor that hash Couchbase hashtag a lot. So. Tweet that out and we'll see it for sure. You can also ask us something on the forums. We have a Couchbase forums or on uh, Stack Overflow. We're, we're always monitoring those channels there. So those are good ways to, if you have a technical question, to get in contact with us. Or you can always email me or tweet me. I'd be glad to help you with any problems or questions you guys have. Speaking of questions, any more before we wrap up for the night? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that less efficient than if I had, like, you know, only one layer deep? 
So the question is, is a smaller document more efficient I than a... Yeah. So, so there is an upper limit to the size of documents okay. in CouchBase. I think it's like 20 meg. Um, so to answer your question, is it more efficient? It's going to depend on how you're trying to access that data, right? So if you're just doing a key operation, just getting by key, it's going to be extremely fast, no matter, no matter, this, no matter what the size of the document is going to be. Uh, if you're doing a, a nickel nickel query, if there's a lot of them, it's going to depend on your indexing, right? So if you're if you're trying to query against some embedded field. You, you know, make sure you have a really good index in it that's going to cover that. Otherwise, it's going to hit your, basically like a table scan. It's going to be relatively slow. Actually, that brings up something that I want to ask earlier, too. Sure. Uh, so I saw on your machine there that you were using like 100 megs of memory for your database. Yes. Is the amount of memory used going to have to be at least the size of the data? Or I saw it had a swap thing. So yeah, good sure questions. So the question is, does the amount of memory have to be at least the size of the data? And the answer is no. Um, in fact, that's hardly ever the case where you have the same amount of RAM as you do disk space, right? So Couchbase typically is going to put as much as it can into, the, into RAM, and especially if you keep using these documents, they're going to stay in RAM. Um, if it runs out of RAM and a request for one comes in that's not in RAM, it's going to eject those values from RAM, and you'll have to make a trip to the disk to do it then, right? So, you know, the more RAM you have, the better, but uh, it will go with default to disk if it needs to. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, go ahead. Does Couchbase have the idea, the concept of transactions? If you got multiple, multiple documents, you want to make sure it's the yeah. database. So the question is about transactions, and when you interact with a single document, that operation is atomic, right? So if you have, like I showed you in the, in the travel sample, a document that has itself an embedded collection of um, other sub-documents, let's call them, right? An array of other JSON objects. When you interact with that document, it's atomic. So that's, that is itself a transaction. If you're interacting with a collection of documents, there is no concept of a transaction there. So each individual interaction is atomic, but as a group, they're not atomic. And that's pretty typical among NoSQL databases, is you're not going to get the same kind of transactions that you get with SQL, but in the same token, you can combine a lot of data into single documents, so you can you know, depend on transactions less often. Yeah, go ahead. One more question. You said that there's a limit to a document. My question is, do you just get an error if you try to put a too large of a document in, or does it internally hmm. extract like, you know, some parts of that document? So so the question is, if you try to insert too big of a document, what's going to happen? I'm guessing it's not going to try to chunk it out. It's not going to truncate it. It's going to just say error, too big, or something like that. I, that's a guess. I've not tried it. It's a very good question, I'm though. I'm just curious, because, because of how JSON documents are, you can basically take out the sub-portions and make your own document. Right. So I wasn't sure if internally it had its own document storage that you don't access, so that it can chunk out those large documents. Yeah. My guess is principal of least surprise, it's going to just say error too big. So Couchbase is not great for storing files, for instance. You wouldn't want to necessarily do that. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much. If you have more questions, I'll be here for however long. So thank you. <laughs>